Hi, this is Mrs. Marita. Welcome to AP Stats, Lesson 1.2a. Our learning targets for today are 1, 2, and 3. We're going to make and interpret dot plots. We'll get to these other graphs later. Today, we're just focusing on dot plots. Then, we're going to identify the shape of the distribution and move on to describing the overall pattern and identifying any major departures from it. So today's lesson is our first lesson in section 1.2. We are moving on from the categorical data, and for the rest of the chapter, we'll be focusing on quantitative data. So we're going to jump into learning targets 2 and 3 right now, and then we'll get back to learning target 1 towards the end of today's lesson. So when we're looking at a distribution, um, this could be any type of graph of quantitative data. We're first going to look at its overall pattern. Then we're going to focus in what are the major departures from this pattern. In general, we are going to consider three main features, center, variability, and shape. So let's get into some of these details of the center, variability, and shape. The center is a typical value that describes your distribution. For example, your mean or your median. We'll talk about the modes of a distribution, but not to describe a measure of center. In AP Stats, we'll always focus on either the mean or the median. For variability, this is how the data is distributed around the center. The most common that you've probably used before is the range, the max minus the min. And in Algebra 2, you probably learned about the standard deviation, but we'll review that. Something new that you'll see is the IQR, the interquartile range. We're going to get into that next um, section in 1.3, but do make a note, your IQR, this interquartile range, is Q3 minus Q1, and that's going to be an easy measure of variability that we'll use in the future. And then last, to describe the shape, there's three main options we use to describe the shape. Skewed left, approximately symmetric, and skewed right. Now, these are nice smooth curves. Usually data is a little more choppier than this, but to get the idea of these shapes, for a skewed left distribution, you can see over here where your extreme values are. We call that the tail. So the tail of your distribution is going, getting pulled towards the left where most of your data is over here to the right. I know for some of our brains this sounds backwards, but this is definitely how skewness is described in distributions for shape. So the direction of your skew is always where the extreme values are. In the center, for an approximately symmetric graph, just know that approximately symmetric graphs are not always single peaked. Sometimes you could have a graph like this green one that's also approximately symmetric. And then similarly, your skewed right, you can see over here, the extreme values are being pulled to the right. That's where your tail is getting pulled. Sometimes we'll say negatively or positively skewed. If they're using that type of vocabulary, then just imagine this on a number line. Your positive numbers are going to the right, and your negative numbers would be going to the left. A secondary way that we can describe shape is with respect to the number of modes. Now, you always need to describe your shape as skewed left, skewed right, or approximately symmetric. But in addition to that, we are going to often comment on the number of modes. The uniform distribution is unique, where this is a rectangular shape. This will be important, especially in chapter two. We'll see this come back again. Unimodal is any distribution, could be skewed right, um, like this distribution here, skewed left, approximately symmetric. But the idea is there's only one mode, one peak. Bimodal, two peaks, and multimodal are more than two. So in this example, we have three modes. Last, if there are any unusual values, we do need to comment on these. Outliers, clusters, and gaps are what we'll focus on. Outliers are very large or very small observations when we compare them to the rest of the data. Clusters are when we have isolated groups of data that are separated from the rest of the distribution. And gaps, well, that's what they say, these are large spaces between groups of data. So now we're going to get into covering learning target number one, making and interpreting dot plots, stem plots, and histograms of quantitative data. These are going to be three of the four ways that you're going to learn to represent quantitative data graphically. We'll also get into box plots later. But today we're only focusing on dot plots. Dot plots are especially good if you have a small set of data. They're going to be the quickest and easiest type of graph to do by hand. And there's only three important features you really need to keep track of. Number one, your dot plots only have a horizontal axis. 
which again makes them quick and easy to draw. Your dots need to be the same size, best you can, above the x-axis or your horizontal axis, and equally spaced. It's also very important to scale and label your axis. 1.2 example 1. A recent study by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, measured the gas mileage, the miles per gallon, for 20 models of cars. The results are shown below. And with these results, we want to construct a dot plot to display the distribution and then describe the distribution. So when you're scaling your axis for your dot plot, we want to skim through the data and we're looking for the lowest value. Looks like 24 is going to be the lowest and then the 41, that looks like the highest. I don't see anything larger than that. So that's going to help scale our axis. Then we're just going to, in order, draw our dot. So for 24, we've got our dot. Maybe check them off as we go. And then 32 and then 40, and 36, and 38, and I just wanted to get, let's see, so 36, 38, I just wanted to get to this next 36. So when you do have a duplicate value, you're going to leave a little space and then just stack the dots on top. So go ahead and finish this dot plot and then we'll check your answer. So once you've completed all the dots, your dot plot should look like this. The only thing we're missing, which we would definitely lose points for, is our label. So on the horizontal axis, we're going to label this the gas mileage. And because we have units, we want to add that too. So this will say is miles per gallon. To describe this distribution, we would say the distribution of gas mileage, MPGs, for these 20 cars is skewed left with a possible outlier at 24 MPG. The center, the median, is 37 MPG, and the variability, we're gonna use our range, is 15 MPG. As we start practicing more on visualizing the shape, something you can do to visualize the shape is to draw a smooth curve. So this is never going to be a real graph. We're not using any software. We're just eyeballing the shape, but that kind of helps you see how the tail to the left is getting pulled in that direction. And so we can say, yeah, this is skewed left. The outlier down here at the end, we're not sure exactly, but that's pretty far out. So there's a big gap and um, that's fair to assume that's an outlier. But later we're gonna learn a formula so you'll be able to say with certainty, yes it is, or no it's not. The center, the median, this is going to be our middle value. Since we had 20 data values, we can count in, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, so my median's going to be right here. That's where I'm getting that 37 from. And then the range, again, this is just your max minus min, so our range, we're gonna do, let's see, that's 41 minus 24. The last part to emphasize here is the context. So make sure you're always including context in your answers in AP stats. You'll absolutely lose points if you just describe generally without bringing in your context. So my hint is always to put the context in the very beginning, then you're done. It'll cover you for the rest of the answer, but it's always good to include units as well.